I have to lead off by telling you, um, I appreciate you came, appreciate you being here. Hi, Paul. Um, I am a much better writer than I am a talker, a speaker. And I'd like to, um, if, if you could indulge me, I, I want to refer to what I've written this afternoon. It's not lengthy at all. And, and I won't totally read. I, I'll just refer to it here and there, okay? Because really, I, I can't talk off the cuff. I've never been able to. But I, but I can write. I did, I did a many um, uh, dialogues. With, I forgot what you call them, but um, commentaries for the public radio station. And I rehearsed it and rehearsed it and rehearsed it, you know? So. It sounded, until it sounded natural. And, but I, I wrote down what I wanted to say today, and, and this is it. When learning to write prose, one tends to read the classics, great novels and essays. When learning to cook, we tend to go to restaurants that feature praiseworthy chefs, or we spend time in our own kitchen trying out recipes from those chefs. The same is true in photography. While learning the skill and practicing the fundamentals, such as control of light and back in the day, the use of shutter speeds and f-stops, while getting that down, we may want to look at and get ideas from those great photographers who came before us. Fortunately, there's no lack of material to consult. You could fill this entire room with books, and periodicals featuring great photography. I brought a, I brought a few. I'll just lay them out if you care to look at them. These are the the books that influenced me. In particular, in particular these. In particular these ones. Yeah. And these are the books that influenced me quite a bit. I love Frank Golgi's work. That's, that's great. Mm -hmm. yeah, for sure. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm a great lover of the Midwest, and so the, um, the, 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 the grain elevator, I've always tried to photograph it and get it right, you know? But you have to have a certain kind of camera to really do it right, and I don't have that kind of camera. But I, he used a I kept. View, hmm? I think he used a view camera or a medium format. I have a medium format, and I tried it, and, and I keep trying it. Is that two and a quarter? Yeah, yeah it is. But I, I couldn't do it as well as Frank can. Uh, continuing on here, uh, with, with all its compartments, photography is about as diverse as the names on mailboxes down on South Grand. There's fashion photography, food and product photography, architectural photography, including the nuts and bolts, real estate photography. There's weekend wedding photography, a welcome side business for otherwise artistic photographers. A couple I can think of right now. There's sweeping landscape photography, a la Ansel Adams. Wildlife photography, some of which is simply amazing. A big piece of the pie lies in portraiture with its many subcategories. Kids, pets, celebrities, boudoir, and bands, to name a few. The list goes on. I carried a camera since I was 10, a compact point-and-shoot brownie bullet. Taking pictures was fun, and you couldn't wait for the prints to get back from the Photoshop so you could pass them around. Too often there was glare or you cut somebody's head off. I don't remember keeping the bad ones. They were embarrassing. I do recall thinking I should take my time and try harder to get it right. I had my first photo assignment from the Grand Rapids Press in 1973. Then I had a Hanamex, had my first 35 millimeter, a Hanamex I think it was made in Mexico, but it didn't have a lot of the features that a Nikon or a Canon would have, but it, it was a 35 millimeter. It was very basic. 
I went to the, I, I, I was in college and I went and I had signed up to be a part of a private Peace, Peace Corps project. And it was called Volunteers for International Development. Now, there were nine of us. Well, they had people going to South America and Central America. And my group was the only group going to Africa. And we were going to Nigeria. And I was 21 at the time. And I, I thought, well, I was enterprising. I thought, I'll go down to the Grand Rapids Press and see if they'd like me to take pictures for them of, of our trip. And they could run it as a feature. I, I met with a photo editor, told him what I was doing, and he gave me a bag full of Triax film, which is a 400-speed black and white film. And I, when I got to, we, we, we landed in Ghana, we went through Togo, and Dahomey, those have different names now. And then we ended up in Nigeria. And I, I had, I was shooting rolls of film, and, and the first roll came out okay. And then after that, <laughs> I, the camera jammed up, and I didn't know how to unjam it. And I, I despaired, and I opened up the, the, the camera to try and get the thing working again. And I didn't, I didn't know how to, there was a little button on the bottom of the camera that you could unwind the film. And I didn't realize that. And I uh, exposed the, the roll. And that, that was a good roll. And uh, I exposed the roll. So sorry. And it was ruined. But that, that venture was not really a failure because I had gone through the motions of being a photojournalist. I, I had gotten the shots. I just couldn't get them out of the camera. I was a bad mechanic, you know. But it, it gave me a taste for photojournalism. In my mid-20s, I was still carrying a camera, looking, it seems, to, to capture Henri Cartier-Bresson's decisive moment before I knew it had a name. Because I didn't know about Henri Cartier-Bresson, but I was looking to capture people doing things that were interesting. <clears throat> for, my, for my type of picture taking, I chose to pursue that elusive subject that might instill emotion if captured the right way. Images that were hopefully poignant or evocative a form of realism that is part photojournalistic, part paparazzi, and part documentary. You see some of these images in my exhibit. Back to the books and the wonderful information they impart. Books introduced me to Walker Evans and Robert Frank, my two biggest influences. Evans came way before Frank. I think I, I think I found Evans, oh gosh, sometime in the early 80s. And when I saw what he had done, it thrilled me to know that what some might call documentary photography had been elevated to the status of fine art. Same with Robert Frank in his iconic book, The Americans. Frank was an immigrant from, from Hungary who looked at America with fresh eyes. He came to America in 1956. He made his proposal to document his, he made his proposal to document his new country in the 1960s, much the same as Evans had documented the rural South for the FSA back in the 30s. Frank's dream was eventually funded by a Guggenheim grant. So I saw what these people were doing, and I had been doing sort of the same thing. And it really gave me hope, you know, like, okay, what, what I'm doing is really good. I mean, it's, it's, it's got a precedent. Um, I don't want to do what they're doing, but, but, you know, it's kind of hard not to in a way. <clears throat> Other influences. 
Diane Arbus with her On the Fringe subjects, Roman Vishniak's study, studies, Hasidic <coughs> Jews in Warsaw and Krakow, pre-World War II, the gut-wrenching photos of war from the intrepid photographers such as Robert Kappa and James Noctway. Have you ever heard of Noctway? Mm -hmm. Have you? He's great. They were two generations apart in their times and places, but equally compelling in their subject matter. Kappa was killed in action, I don't know if you know that, uh, in Vietnam shooting photographs during the French incursion of Vietnam in the 1950s. Hemingway said of Kappa's death, it is a long day to think of him gone, because they were friends. People are my primary subjects. Although roadside attractions and what's been termed vulgar architecture, diners, shine parlors, barber shops, are right up there for me as well. People are definitely more of a challenge and there's a lot of satisfaction from getting it right on your own terms. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Missouri Photo Workshop. It's been going on in Missouri since 1949. It's sponsored by the University of Missouri Columbia and what they do is they recruit, you have to apply, and you have to be accepted. And then you, if you're accepted, you go to a one small town in Missouri. And you get a, five days, basically Monday through Friday, to come up with a story about that something or someone in that town. And it's really a challenge. People come from all over. They even come from Europe and Australia and New Zealand. And, um, and, and, and the instructors are, are working photographers who um, have great credentials. They work for uh, National Geographic and they work for uh, Vanity Fair maybe. They work for a number of different prominent publications. And I remember that, it, it was right during the OJ trial, I remember that because I was in my motel room and OJ, they were always reporting on OJ. It was, the jury was coming to a, a decision that week. But I, um, like a few other people, I didn't get my, my first story accepted. I, 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 there was a ghost town outside of this, oh, by the way, we went to Trenton, Trenton, Missouri, up in north, northwestern Missouri. It's a town, maybe, maybe 5,000 people. And I thought it would be interesting to get this ghost town to document that. Like, there was one business, guy had a gas station in a, in a little market. I thought, you know, like, this is a dying town. I will document this guy's demise. And I brought it to the editor, and he didn't like it because it was just stagnant. He wanted something that was unfolding. In a town of 5,000 or 3,000, there's not much that's unfolding. But um, I had photographed, you know, the, the building and, and, and the, the front of the gas station. And, and I remember the, the instructor said to me, uh, you know, he, he dismissed my work, and, and I didn't get to do that story. I had to come up with another one at the very last moment. Um, but he, he, had, he dismissed my still lifes, and he said, something I won't forget. Uh, they were, like my still lifes were buildings, signage, the, the, the area around the, the, the town, you know, the landscapes. He said, you didn't do that. And meaning that the subject was already there, it, just waiting for you to photograph it. It didn't move or blink or display emotion or do anything surprising. It was there for the taking. You didn't have to work too damn hard to get it on film. Maybe wait for the right time of day for the best light. 
And I thought, well, you know, you're right. So, you know, that, that got me thinking, you know, that people are, are what makes a story. People and what they do. And, you know, so you, you see that around here, you know, people, a, a guy walking, a little boy in a shopping cart, and, and, uh, and, and a gas station attendant filling the tire of a guy in a wheelchair, and um, a girl with one leg getting a, getting a shower on a hot day at Strassenfest, mm -hmm. and it goes on and on. And um, a baby being born, you know, I really felt at that point, you know, this is what I need to do. And I had been doing it up to a point, but I, I committed myself even more to like try to photograph people, uh, you know, at some important point in their, you know, it could be, uh, it could be a, a blasé moment in their life, or it could be an important moment in their life, like being born. But I wanted to get them, capture them, having some sort of a, a emotional moment. And uh, that's what I kept on doing. And, and I'll keep on doing it. <laughs> okay. I can answer questions. Do you find with your landscapes, uh, those pictures there, are you also shooting people when you do those? Yeah. I tr yeah. I, I, I always would like to get people in, in the pictures. But, I mean, do you do port, like, do you actually go up to people and sort of single them out in portraits as you're taking the, the landscapes? landscape? You know, do you go back and forth? Do you see people and then shoot them within the context of the landscape? I, 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 I'm sneaky by nature, and, and I would rather shoot them without them knowing it. Mm -hmm. And if they notice me shooting them, then I would I would have no problem going up to, going up and telling telling them what I'm doing. Those guys didn't didn't see me. Like at that at that green elevator, they didn't see me photographing them. Yeah, but I guess my question is more like, are you still doing this kind of work here within while you're shooting the landscapes, or are you pretty much doing the landscapes? What kind of landscapes? Architectural? Well, yeah, like I I would consider those landscapes, even though they're townscapes. So I guess what I'm saying, what I'm trying to ask is, do you go back and forth? I want people in the pictures. Mm -hmm. If, if, if the, the grain elevator has a purpose, mm -hmm. which is to you know get farmers to come in and drop mm -hmm. off their grain, yeah, I definitely want to get the farmers in the picture. Right. I definitely want to. Now, like he, he, that Golki, whatever, um, yeah, he didn't have any people in his pictures. Right. You know, he's just interested in the. Architecture. Yeah. But no, I, I want people to you know sh uh, to depict them like in the context of the green elevator mm -hmm. and what it means to them. Mm -hmm. I have another one. I think you saw it where where the woman a woman is driving up in a tractor. You know she's got a bunch of grain. She's going to drop off. Mm -hmm. That's over I think in Millstadt. Um, yeah, I've always been interested. I didn't grow up on a farm or anything like that, but I've always been interested in agricultural. Mm -hmm. okay. When did you start doing boxes? Those are great. 2013, last year. What, what was... I, I, what I've was been wanting to do it for years and years, and finally I had the place to do it, and I, I spread everything out. And I, and I really put... I really went up there quite a bit. I took to the studio in Maplewood. I was up there a lot. And I would, it would, the hours would just go by. I'm like, I'd get there like maybe 11 o'clock in the morning. Before I knew it, it was like 3 o'clock in the afternoon. You know, it's just, and quiet. I like quiet. I don't like any, any noise. Just concentrate. On what? On, on, on what elements I wanted to put into the boxes, you know, because I would try this and try that, and, 
you know, it would take a long time. You know, I would see, you know, okay, what, what works here? Th this thing is, uh, like, connotates that, and this thing connotates this. Maybe they don't code it, maybe they don't mix. But this thing is blue, and this thing is also blue, so I don't like that. You know, I want color, I want diversity. Are you forming narratives? Or is it more about just the visual juxtapositions? Most of them are about the lab, what you mentioned, the visual mm -hmm. juxtaposition. Most of them. Yeah. But, um, but, but I, I definitely didn't want to have too many of the same kind of elements in, in the same box. I like to. Same thing with writing, too. I mean, like, like if you use one word, in this paragraph, you don't want to use it in that paragraph too. Right. You want to mix it up. Now, um, I forgot to mention, I had the uh, fortune to work for the Riverfront Times for 22 and a half years, both part time and full time, and they. I had a column where I walked around with a camera and interviewed people on the street that whole time. I did other stuff, but I always had that column. And they paid for me to, uh, to get the pictures. They paid for my film, they paid for my development, and the, uh, the proof sheets, and, and the photos. And in the very beginning, I, I would turn in after the column came out, Street Talk, I would turn in the photos and thinking that they would maybe keep them somewhere. And then one day I came, when they were down at Lafayette Square, I went to the office and, and my pictures and proof sheets and negatives were like thrown in a corner of a closet. And I said, okay, I'm gonna keep them. I'm keeping them. Because I, at that point, I didn't think that they were mine. I didn't think they belonged to me. I thought they belonged to the paper with Ray Hartman. But I just decided to keep them. And I, I always kept them after that. So I have quite, quite an archive. Quite an archive. 85, at least 8,500 photographs. Uh, I mean, uh, people photographed. Way, way more photographs than that because I photographed each person at least five times five frames for each person. So we're, we're talking, you know, 20,000 frames or whatever. Did these portraits come from that period of time when you were working for Ray Hartman? Yeah, a lot of them did, but not all. But a lot of them did. 82 to 2004, and this is the camera I use. I had three of them. It's a Pentax K1000. It's kind of heavy. It's all it's all manual. Yeah. All it's manual. Heavy. Wow. Surprisingly heavy. Those were the days. Oh, gosh. I still have mine. Yeah. Like, wow, it is heavy. Is that heavy? No, I don't know. I have an old tub. That's probably from I like about 1970. Uh huh. <clears throat> and it doesn't have a uh, meter in it. That yeah, it does. It does. Okay. Well, it does have a meter. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's all manual, but it's got f stops and shutter speed, and then mm -hmm. and then it's got a meter. It's a needle, yeah. a needle in the that, that tells you if you're underexposed or overexposed. And then last year I went to this camera, kind of reluctantly because I'm a luddite. What is that? It's a Canon uh, Rebel. I think it's uh -huh. a Canon Rebel. I believe. Digital or not? Huh? Is that digital? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it says cool picks, cool picks. Nikon, I think. But you know, and, and then this is handy. Like, you know, like if my daughter's in the soccer field, I, I, can, I, I can zoom it up and, and get a pretty good picture of her from far away. And it, it's, it's handy. It's nice, yeah. Um, a lot of people who use digital put everything on their computer. <clears throat> I, I haven't learned to do that, but 
I just go to Walgreens and make prints. Do you save the digital? You don't save the digital files, then, or you do? Yeah, well, I do, but I, I really kind of, after I have a print, mm -hmm. then I kind of, I, I might delete it. But you've got it on the CD that Walgreens returns to you. No. Oh no. Oh no. No, I just go there and make a print. Oh, you don't ask them for the CD. You should ask no. them. No. Yeah. Ask them. Yeah, you should. You're basically, I mean, losing. Because if, if you have a print, that's you'll only have that one print, and that's it. And if you scan that, the quality is not going to be as good. If you wanted to duplicate that. Now, I you, know. Are so, you it's happy? a whole new ball game. It's are you happier with your old, with your Canon, than you were with your Pentax? Would you repeat that? Which makes you happier? Oh, that one. That one, okay. Oh, yeah. Why? I like that one. I, I feel good with that one. Why? But again, I'm a Luddite. I, I, I cling to the old ways. Uh-huh. But, oh, that's the only reason then. It doesn't, the, the quality of pictures are the same? <clears throat> oh, I, I, I can tell you, I missed a lot of photos with that camera because I couldn't get it ready in time, you know, uh -huh. get it out. And because I don't have a zoom lens on it that can yeah. react quickly yeah. to the situation. But um, the, the, the photos that come from the digital, I, I find, are kind of, kind of metallic in look, seems to me. Yeah, that's, that a, that's, that's a good word for it. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> they're, they're kind of metallic in look, and the, and the photos that come from this camera, they could be warmer in look. And you can't put ectochrome in but, the digital camera. But mechanically, this camera is better because mm -hmm. you, you can get a picture a lot quicker, mm -hmm. and, and it has a built-in zoom lens, and you, you can just you know, and, and you get the picture. Um, and, th and there's a whole lot of things that this camera does that I don't even know about. I know. There's a lot. This was my daughter's camera. I bought it for her, and then she went took a college class, and then she had to have an even better camera, and I had to buy her like a $700 uh, single lens reflex digital camera. So she gave me that one. That was originally hers. Do you ever thought about maybe loading it into your computer so you'd have it? No, because no, because I'm already too busy. I can't. But maybe if I retire or something, I could. I'm too busy for that. I, you know. But you know, he's right. You can actually, if you go to Walgreens and put your little chip in that machine, it will save all the pictures, and you can get a disc and at least have the record. Because it would be a shame. I mean, it's like basically burning your negative, negative yeah. after a f yeah. making a print. Yeah, I'll do that. Or giving it away to gypsies. Yeah. So, so, so there's, <laughs> like there's three or four hundred, there's three or four four hundred, hundred images on the camera. Yeah, so I Kinko's would. also has that yeah. facility, and they have people there that can assist you. At Walgreens, you right. know, you're on your own. But Kinko's people are really helpful. The one in Brentwood, I recommend. And yeah. it's the same cost. It's like 29 cents for a four by six. Yeah, and don't yeah. So I mean, you don't lose them because, because you, otherwise you'll they're going to be gone. Yeah. And all you have is the one print, which you can't really print. duplicate because you'll never get the quality that that digital file had by like scanning that print. Yeah, It'll just you're right because with this with the the Pentax, I have proof sheets. <coughs> and I have I have uh, negative negatives on holders for every roll I shot. Mm -hmm. So hundreds and hundreds. Yeah. And I bet so, so with, with, with the new one. Yeah, Schiller's would do that. Yeah, so, so with the yeah. digital, it was bought at Schiller's. So with, with, with that digital, then I would have the CD and the prints. Mm -hmm. Because it would be a shame to lose all that work, you know. I mean, you're would, obviously would, archiving it, your negatives. No, you're right. It would be a shame, but it wouldn't be that bad because I already have them print. Everything in there that I care about has been printed out. Yeah, but only once. True. <laughs> True. True.
All they want. The archivist in me is horrified. So. <laughs> I, you know, I have to say, I, I, one of those people, I resent uh, technology, I guess, advancement. I resent it. I like, I just cling to the old ways. Well, there's beauty in there is. those prints and those gelatin yeah. silver prints and negatives. And, yeah, you know, I... Like, like you on Facebook complained about being on having to deal with AT&T, and you had a problem with your phone, and it took you a lot of effort and a lot of time to get it fixed. Same thing, same thing I'm talking about. Yeah. You know, in the old, in the back in the day, you wouldn't have to go through 18 prompts. You know, you, you, would, get a, you would get on the phone with a human being, and they would fix it for you. Right, yeah, true. I hope you resolve that. Today. Well, we'll see when the next bill we'll comes. I almost got a an break. hour and 20 oh, minutes on awful. the phone. I hate AT&T. I, <laughs> I will know, I never do business with them ever again. <laughs> and then they have the audacity to send me this text <coughs> that said, so, you know, how do you feel about our service? We hate like, you. <laughs> zero. Oh, I'm sorry that you feel that way. And it's like, you know, and then they, yeah. and then like at the very end they said something else about, we hope you'll recommend you know, our services, I'm like, I, I type back, there's no hope for you. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you're talking to Siri. I know. Siri is just about, oh, I know. I like that. Terrible. But, but really, the great, the great, great thing about the digital camera is you can take a picture and you can show it to people right away. Right. I yeah. that's, that's, that's the feedback. really good thing yeah. about it. Instant I mean, it's, gratification. It's great for it. experimenting too because you can, I feel like you can experiment more with it because you immediately see the result and then yeah. you can tweak things as, you know, as you're going <clears throat> instead of like a week later being like, ah, oh, I have to go back again and get the right light, <coughs> you know. That's true. So, I mean, it has it's, its pluses. Easier. And I can give my camera to Isabel and, and not be concerned about the money it costs and just here, have at it, you know? <laughs> Take as many pictures as you want, you know? I mean, it's great. Not burning like, up expensive yeah, things. I happen. can't do that with my kids. They, they would wreck it. They would, they would. Really? They would find a way to wreck it. They would drop it down the toilet or something. They would do something with it. How many kids do you have? I got five little girls. And they, and they, are, they, are they young? Yeah. And they are, they just, and they're very grabby, too. How old are they, the children? Seven, six, nearly five, three and two. And then you have your older daughter. Yeah. She's lovely, very pretty girl. Thank you. 